China, the most populous country in the world and one of the biggest economies, has a massive education sector. According to reports, the nationwide student enrollment in the kindergarten to class 12 segment are projected to grow from 325.3 million in 2019 to 659.5 million by 2024. China's education sector is also extremely competitive. and this has led to the growth of a huge private tutoring sector which has also become highly profit driven this has attracted the attention of regulators who in july decided to crack down on this sector for the benefit of students and parents how is the private tutoring sector grown over the years and what are the reasons what has been the government's response and what is its impact things chuck of dongsheng news explains i think one of the um, big Um, legislative changes of this last year was the regulations on the private tutoring industry. I think for your listeners to get a sense of why the private tutoring industry became um, so- something that needed to be regulated was that um, China's education system is quite meritocratic. It's very test heavy. Um, the the Gaokao, which is the uh, university entrance exam, is one of the most stressful periods of any child's life. And what that created was um, basically a system of private tutoring that became kind of a you know in a home style based private tutoring, grew into these large uh, companies that were trying to help kids uh, catch up, um, or in, in the end it became to get ahead of the school curriculum. Um, and what happened was in July of this year, the Chinese government made an announcement. That they were going to reel in on this private tutoring industry, or what's called the double reduction policy.、Uh, the double reduction being they want to simultaneously reduce the pressure on school children,、um, especially this competitive nature of schooling, and then also the financial burden on parents. Because what has happened is,、uh, in order for kids to catch up, or families, you know, the pressures for their kids to catch up, it means that you have to pay、uh, for these additional services. And of course, this is really、um, reserved for those who are, you know, coming from well-off、uh, upper middle class,、uh, middle class families, or or our families are even getting indebted to do that.、Um, and so, the private industry, just to give you a sense of how large it had grown, is that it, from the 1990s it started emerging,、uh, and the first company、uh, was actually lost,、uh, listed in the New York Stock Exchange in 2006, so about 15 years ago, and that was New Oriental. And in those last 15 years, it has ballooned、uh, to a 120 billion dollar industry,、uh, with over 300 million Chinese students enrolled in these private tutoring sector. And it got to a point、uh, where the government actually came in, the Ministry of Education came in and called it、um, a sector that has been hijacked by capital. And so this、uh, we can see as being part of a series of measures that has been trying to reel in these excesses of capital in certain industries, like in private education.、Uh, but we've also seen similar kinds of、uh, activities in, you know, the big tech sector and、uh, around monopolistic practices. The crackdown on private tutoring and the larger approach to education has been part of an understanding of common prosperity that has sought to address inequality and bridge gaps between various sections of the population. How is education being viewed in this context? What concrete benefits do Chinese students get as part of this new approach? How are their day-to-day lives affected?、Um, I think that's the, one of the kind of buzzwords of the year:、uh, common prosperity. And and I know that、um, I think in English it can sometimes sound、um, mysterious. So maybe just to step back a bit about what common prosperity, how it originates. I think there's. Two ways of describing what common prosperity means.、Um, the first being,、uh, it's kind of a, a more of a concept that has a long tradition in Chinese history, philosophy, and politics,、um, just around you know the common good and sharing the social wealth of a society with all.、Um, but in the socialist period since the creation of the People's Republic of China in 1949, common prosperity has been used by leaders like Mao Zedong to Deng Xiaoping to talk about.、Um, Uh, how basically socialist construction,、uh, particularly in the period of Deng, in the opening up and reform period,、um, the idea of developing the productive forces rapidly,、uh, which we saw after 1978, was also、um, not just about economic development, but it was also about how to improve、um, the livelihoods of people.、Um, so this quick, fast, sustained pace of economic growth has to have a social consequence. 
Um, and but of course, what we saw is that you know during this period of rapid economic growth, there were also serious contradictions. Um, we saw increased inequality in China, um, not only between the rural and urban uh, areas, but also between regions, like between the Western, uh, more impoverished regions with the Eastern, more developed regions. Um, we saw the, you know, the what it's called now the three mountains that are being faced by a per particular working families is uh, housing, healthcare, and education costs have really skyrocketed. And so this, now what we're seeing as common prosperity is sort of the next stage in the economic development phase. And this is part of a series of cycle reforms uh, that the government is starting to put in place uh, is to basically balance how do you look at a sustained economic growth while strengthening some of these wealth fair mechanisms? Um, uh, whether it's now there's huge discussions on, on tax reforms, uh, whether it's uh, real estate, inheritance, um, uh, income taxes, et cetera. Uh, it's looking at how to strengthen social security. Um, and where the education component comes in is around this uh, uh, rec uh, recognizing that education inequality has to be addressed. So we can see the crackdown on the private tutoring industry as part of the aims of uh, achieving common prosperity. Um, so we've actually seen this as a part of many measures. I mean, one of, I actually uh, live in Shanghai and I overlook uh, a middle school. And one of the things that I really noticed, because not only is it to reduce this sort of after school uh, uh, sort of test driven um, tutoring system, but it's also to increase, for example, arts and sports education. So you actually see even in the school system, how much more sports education is being encouraged um, to because it's about, uh, in, you know, improving the, the minds and the health, the physical health and the mental health of kids as well. Um, so that's one thing that we've been really seeing. Um, but beyond that, they're also looking at um, um, also the, the teachers. One of the things is that the teacher salaries in the public education system has um, been uh, lower than the private sector, and especially many of the teachers have been attracted by this private, private tutoring industry. So there's been new commitments to increasing teacher salaries. Um, and also this really interesting pilot programs because Chinese society is one that really you know, tests uh, and experiments with, with policy before implementing on a national scale. And we've seen two pilot programs just recently implemented that are quite interesting. One is actually uh, to do a system of where the, the top teachers and principals of the public schools are put into a rotation system so that they get to work for a period of time in schools across this entire city. That's one of the ways of trying to sort of balance or or at least make more available the top teaching resources, which sometimes you know are related to okay the elite. Uh, or the top public schools are in the areas where real estate speculation is high and the real estate prices are high. So they're trying to address these multiple factors at the same time. So one is this teacher rotation pilot program. And, and the second um, just came out now is that they're actually trying to create an online platform now that's a free platform, a government platform in Beijing to offer free tutoring to students now. So this is one of the ways to sort of address the fact that there are still parents who are looking for um, additional support for students, but now is not under sort of the private capital uh, profit driven motive. So they're starting to do that pilot and they're going to be uh, implementing that across the schools in Beijing by the end of next year.